<laughs> giggly now. Five, four, three. I'm giggling now for no reason. This is annoying. Hang on. The next one is two. <laughs> oh, God, I can't even get started now. <laughs> After. Okay. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one. Hello, and welcome to Theory of Obscurity. He's Apple Mask. And he's Kridoff. Hey, I didn't. I didn't even check that with you beforehand, and you got it. That's good. <laughs> so in this, podcast, I was a drama student. I can do improv. <laughs> in this podcast, we delve into what popular culture has either forgotten or ignored. In media such as movies, books, TV shows, records, and anything else that we can send to each other as a YouTube link or a digital file. In this episode, we both sent each other two things that are. Technically, movies of a kind. Uh, would you agree? Technically, uh, <laughs> my one in particular just barely qualifies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Apple Mask sent me the amazing Mr. Bickford, a 1987 compilation of the animated work of one Bruce Bickford, featuring the music of Frank Zappa. And I sent him a horror anthology movie called Tales from the Quad Ed Zone by Chester Novell Turner, which was also produced in 1987. Uh, one thing I'll say just before, I'm going to start with the amazing Mr. Bickford, but one thing I want to get clear right off the bat is that um, Apple Master, you did see a review for this already online, your, um, your film, of course. Yes. Uh, TYTD Reviews. TTYD reviews, I think. TTY. It's some it's some combination of those letters, yeah. Because I sh I just want to get uh, it clear in the interest of full disclosure, as American news sites are, f are fond of saying, that I, it is a channel I have some affiliation with. I both provided the current theme music for the main series on that channel, the little synthy bit, and I was also the one who suggested yeah. that film be reviewed on that channel because I have a. Oh, that's a right, you were. Yeah, <laughs> you mentioned that in the review. Yeah, I get a shout out at the beginning, so that was yeah. nice of him. Yes, and I, and I have uh, communicated with him with him a number of times over email. We have been trying to get something, to do like a, um, a, a a collaboration, but it sort of keeps getting away from us. But maybe someday yeah. soon, we'll manage to do that. So I'm going to start off with talking about the amazing Mr. Bigfoot. So as I said. Um, Frank Zappa was basically responsible for like collecting all this. It's um, I don't know much about Bruce Bickford. Can you fill me? I mean, I know there's obviously I'll say on the internet, but I just want to hear it from you. Um, <laughs> put me on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bruce Bickford um was an animator as Zappa satellite who didn't really get a lot of the acclaim that he really deserved at the time. That's part of the reason Frank collected all the bits and bobs he'd done and put it into a video. Um, he used to be a Marine. He was in he was in Vietnam and that, I think, uh, affected uh, quite a lot of his work, quite a lot of his worldview. Uh, there's a little monologue by him at the start um, which gives some sort of insight into his... Uh, into his worldview if you could decipher it. He mostly worked in clay, and there's some 2D animations as well, but he mostly worked in clay at the end, about the same time as Will Vinton, except where Will Vinton was going for realism, relatively speaking, with big talking raisins, uh, Bickford was avant-garde and surrealist and what you might expect from a collaborator with Frank Zappa, really. Yes. And... Um... That monologue you mentioned, if I just, in my notes, I just scroll down, I try to transcribe it as best as I can. So for the benefit of everyone listening to this, uh, this is, I, I believe, what he said. Neither the torture chamber nor the disco know about the existence of each other, but there is psychic contact between the two. Evil doings on the disco floor have a counterpart, and then I couldn't quite make the next bit out because someone screams on top of it. Uh, the more you... <laughs> 
the more you get engrossed in modern day notions about talismans and any kind of psychic art and the manipulation of psychic objects, pretty soon you realize that anything goes. Some guy can pick up a handful of dog shit and say, look, behold this, and the force field around it will flow into you. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, most of what he says there is well, almost entirely incoherent. So, yeah. Uh, obviously, because obviously of his um, experiences and the time he grew up and became a man, and obviously, I mean... Yeah. yeah. And I mean, pre- presumably he wasn't on drugs because Zappa wouldn't have had him in the house otherwise. Yeah, that is true. It's just a sort of... Um, I, I, I did find this quite a difficult watch because it's just so relentless and it's also so grim, understandably, because of his experiences in Vietnam and everything. Yeah. And um, it's sort of, it's very mono, maniacal and it's sort of in both its its uh, method of doing it, just the sheer, I mean, it's an extreme talent at work, really, and on a purely technical thing. Obviously, when it comes to stories, it's that's like completely secondary to just splurging things out on the screen. And, Splurge um, is the operative word here, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So I didn't know any of this. Um, uh, I didn't know about his Vietnam uh, times uh, when I watched this. And it was sort of, I could tell that, I mean, obviously you just watch it and you see just endless like carnage again and again and again. And it's, um, I, I did get slightly put off in a way that was understandable uh, because he makes that, link between discos and fascism in a weird way that was a thing that like american music critics used to do a lot um you know they sort of it did rub me up the wrong way i can see why he says that because that is obviously after his time he hates it and everything it just sort of as it's just it's understandable that somebody with his worldview would obviously not like the genre that gave us chic but i like chic so it's <laughs> you know it's, it's just it's just a weird yeah. thing yeah it's 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 odd being reminded of older people than me um musical tastes and their way of yeah. for people from that time trying to tie it into some grand overarching theory of why everything is evil or something it, it exists it exists therefore it's evil and we have to figure out how to justify that <laughs> but um it, it, yeah, as I said, it was a very, very difficult watch. I mean, at, at yeah. first, I was really, I was really into it. It begins. Well, the first clip is, I believe, from an earlier uh, animation. You must have done maybe. In, I'm not sure when, but it's um, portraying. 1971, I believe. Yes. Okay, that was the time. Given, yeah, the Vietnam thing. It, yeah, that's about the time I would expect it. Yeah. And already, it's extremely technically complicated and um virtue virtue i can't say the word what's the word virtue was virtual virtual was i can't say the vir i don't know what you mean i'm not sure it is actually a word maybe it isn't <laughs> virtuoso Virtu- yeah virtuoso whatever the that that version uh, okay never mind <laughs> yeah, st- whatever the adject whatever the adjective form of virtuoso is yes <laughs> that but uh, I mean, to the point where he's animating like blood bursts through clay in like in seemingly um in bare air. I mean, obviously he's not doing that, but like he's he must have had something where he had like a like a sheet of glass and like sort of you know filmed it at a certain angle, and it's just yeah. e- extraordinary. But obviously it's a very difficult watch because that first bit is sort of drama a dramat. Now I can't say dramatization now that's great isn't it um uh it's a dramatization of when um uh, slaves revolted in in the united states the south against their white masters and obviously it's it it, i mean just against white people in general yeah and it's just obviously given the the current historical moment we find ourselves in it's it's a tough watch i mean it'd be a tough watch any time you know and it's um for the record, it's called Last Battle on Flat Earth. Like, oh, yeah, I saw that title and I wasn't sure. Mm. Yeah, I forgot I forgot that was the title. Yeah, so again, it's just very uh, grim and oppressive is the word, obviously. It then goes yeah. on to the second clip, which is before 
just this endless sort of array of stuff that happens for the most of the rest of the video. And it's what's called oddly as um, line animation, and it's like drawn animation. For some reason, it's called yeah. line animation. I don't know why... Because you draw lines, I suppose. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> yes, but like I was wondering if it was like a... I don't know, some special technique. But anyway, yeah, it is just drawn and it moves in the same kind of very deliberate way that um, the rest of the of of the of the animations uh, on this tape work. It's sort of it's not sluggish as such, but it's a very deliberate sort of relentless thing. Uh, the word relentless yeah. keeps happening, but it's just sort of constant 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 it's not never really speeding and it's never really just at a crawl it's just this slow drip of mania really from that point onwards it's uh, it goes into like a full extended uh, collage of various bits and pieces all and all of this has frank zappa's orchestral music on them and so it's that sort of attempt at doing um, a typical kind of mid 20th century classical avant garde kind of stuff. It's the three um, Pierre Boulet conducted bits from The Perfect Stranger and another one from the London Symphony, or- Symphony Orchestra album. Yeah. At one point, I found myself having to just, I, I, I downloaded the video off of YouTube. I was and I had to. I was playing it in VLC Media Player, and I and I just felt compelled at one point to speed it up to about three times or four times the speed. And funny enough, I could. It wasn't just blasting by in a blur. I could still comprehend the images, but they could. They were like it was just sort of. They were still there. I could follow everything that was happening. Well, after enough after a fact, because because it was. Yeah. The weird thing of it is that there seems to be dialogue, I think, at various points, because characters' mouths move, but of course, because it's all got music dubbed over it, I don't know whether there was dialogue originally or whether it was meant to be, but he never got around to doing it or what, I don't know. I think it's meant to be just like a silent pe- people's mouths flapping in a silent film. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, actually, that makes sense, yeah, because it is... It's just sort of, it, it, it's sort of, it's weird because like it's easy to grasp roughly what's happening, but it's sort of confusing at the same time because there's just, yeah. it's a, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And it's sort of amazing, but it, I was extremely worn down and yeah. by the end of it. And it was um, like at one point, somebody's in a, I think it's in a shed and then it zooms into a painting or something. Now, there's like a ritual that happens with a kind of something a bit that looks like a, a Christian kind of iconography, but not quite, and it's like in a yeah. circle. There's, it zooms into the painting and then the painting comes alive, then there's like a volcano in the painting and then it turns into food or something and then the, the, the head sort of goes and sort of eats the smoke and then we pan over a Viking long ship and so we think, oh, we've gone back in time now, but then we go back to the person and one of the people we saw before. It's, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, as I, as you said, splurging is the operative word. So, <laughs> so yeah, because of all that, it's, it's, it's very hard to talk about at length because um, there's just... Without visual aids. Yeah, yeah. It's... Um, it's interesting, actually, how Frank Zappa did gravitate towards these marginal figures and give them sort of some, um, you know, major exposure. The most famous example, yeah. of course, being you know Captain Beefheart. Who, you know, he yeah. he you know recorded his produced rather his biggest you know most well known album, the one that's yeah. it's in the U.S. Office Registry of Audio Recordings or whatever it's called, the National. Something oh, yeah, like that. the same yeah. same place that's archived certain selected films. Yeah, so it's in there, I yeah. believe. And he and he restarted Beefheart's career a few years later with uh, that collaborative album they did. Yes, yes. Pongo yeah. Fury. Yeah, yeah. After what was it that he did? Blue jeans and blue, moonbeams. Blue jeans and moonbeams. I don't know what. I don't know what was going on there. Yeah, it sort of yeah nearly came a cropper there, but. Uh, yeah, again, I, I, I can't really talk any more about it because it's just, I would have to really sort of do a whole recap of everything and I would basically write a whole, 
I did actually try and recapping it at one point, and then yeah. I had to give up about three minutes in because it was just you're basically on a high into nothing doing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't realise properly. Yeah, but it is interesting. It's not the kind of thing I would like to watch myself. I mean, it, it's 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 it, I'm glad it exists, but it's not yeah. the kind of thing I'm really into. It's too. I mean, it's understandably so anguished and everything, but it's like it's it's on a level that I can't quite tune into. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm not like I don't want to like throw it in a bin or anything. Obviously, it's just sort of it, it's good that it exists, and I think some people will definitely get something out of it. Bruce Bickford uh, sadly died a few months ago. Yes, I was doing a bit of research earlier. Yeah, I was doing a bit of research. I did notice that, yes. I first came across uh, the Bickford animations. Um, Some of it, bits of it, were shown on the old Grey Whistle test once. Ah. As backing to City of Tiny Lights, which is quite an up-tempo jazz fusion song. And it comes across somewhat less bleak with that backing than it did with, you know, The Perfect Stranger and Dupree's Paradise. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, you do raise a good point there, actually. Kind of, yeah, I didn't even, like, think of that. But, yeah, with Frank Zappa's full-on channelling of all this kind of mid-20th century sort of yeah. serialist kind of thing, 12 turn... Edgar Perez and yeah. Stravinsky. Yes, all that. It's sort of... Uh, it's it make it it, it autom- when you hear that you automatically think of like an Eastern European animation on BBC Two in like nineteen eighty four. Yeah. yeah. If you want to check it out, do check it out, but be prepared. It is just relentless. It is absolutely relentless. And yes. If you're into Zapper, if you're into animation, you really should check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, especially if you're a Zapper fan, and uh, it ends with a big close up of Frank's nose. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's sort of... Uh, I, I did write that bit down. Hang on, let's... Uh, if I can quite just... abruptly. Yeah, quite... But, yeah, it zooms in on, like, a big nose. I think, like, there's these two faces and, like, one goes, ah, and it bites the other nose. Then it mixes to a close-up or it's obviously Zappa's nose and then it has captioned, it's a honker, and then it fades out and you had home video underneath. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, by way of a... By way of a video logo. yeah. It's, uh, and I like how it like it appears at the very end as well, which is uh, quite a, a novel thing for a home video logo, of course. You know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, shall we talk about um, the thing I sent you then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tales from the Quadded Zone. Um, I watched the whole thing and it never explains what Quadded means. No, no. <laughs> or why the cap? Or, or why the uh, final letter D is capitalised, but um, I really don't think it matters very much. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, I there there is. I I sh- it's weird because I really genuinely love this film, even through it doesn't. It's just so, it's just so jarring and things. It, I mean, it begins with a sort of weird wailing noise that sounds like something off of a power electronics record or something. Yeah, and then it launches into this kind of Casio keyboard. A Halloween knees up sort of thing with like yeah, yeah with squeaky voices and everything. Yeah, Crypt Keeper rap. Yeah, <laughs> and it's um it notes at the beginning it says it's dedicated to his father. I think he must have died at yeah. around about the same time. Yeah, but um, uh, I better not talk about it myself. You do your best yeah. to <laughs> interpret it. Yeah, this is basically a home movie, written, directed, uh, and actually chopped, shot, and scored by uh, Chester Novell Turner. I honestly... It's the kind of thing I, I look at and I wonder how it exists. Because this is this is just Chester Novell Turner and some of his mates and he's filmed them with a camcorder doing some stuff he's talked them into doing. <laughs> yes. It takes the form of a sort of a portmanteau horror film in the, in the amicus sort of mould. Um, the framing stories are about this mad black lady with a with massive glasses and a dead ghost son who communicates by whispering and wind effects and she t- and she tells him some stories from this book Tales from the Quadet Zone. Yes, 
Yeah, I think the woman in real life was uh, Chester Neville Turner's wife, I believe. Yeah. And yeah, I think they're still married. Yeah. 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 Um, it, the Wikipedia page um, accuses it of being black exploitation, but I don't really see that myself. No. It's just made by some. It's just made by some black people. Yeah. And and the first story is about white people. It's about this Hick family who are very poor and don't have enough to eat. They're, they they survive on a ham sandwich each every day. Except that there's half as many sandwiches as there are people, so they have to play musical ham sandwiches. <laughs> yes, yeah. And that's after the patriarch rings a bell with a thing on it and says uh, some dumbass grace prayer in rhyme to let the audience know how many people there are around the table. And then they all go for the ham sandwiches and four of them get one and the other four have to do without. So I expected them to start eating each other. But it's a lot more simple than that. The big beardy dungarees guy basically takes a rifle and shoots four of them so now there's enough. He's actually quite impressive looking as a big hillbilly hulk. He's <laughs> he's actually he's big and he's he's big and he's blonde and he's bearded. Yeah, and he he just looks the part. Yeah, and um, he, it's a weird thing about it is that it sort of it it ends extremely abruptly. It threatens to have another scene where the same thing happens again, and then he seems to realise well that's just he's run out of the story, so he just so he just stops and goes into a montage explaining <laughs> that the big fat guy eventually shoots everyone except his mum and dad, who are living high on the hog in the witness protection program. Yes, and he was, and he was executed in a state gas chair. Yeah, which apparently is a, which is a thing. Yeah, seems more humane than the electric chair, at least. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I kind of have the theory that originally there was meant to be like a whole other scene where maybe something different happened, but then there was yeah. I don't know maybe he lost the tape got kind of got messed up or something and then he yeah. had to like salvage it i just feel it's one of those well, they got fed up with him yeah yeah something like that happened yeah i i feel that was there probably was more and maybe it was just like the repetition of another scene before it went on to you know finish it but yeah so yeah so in between of these things of course there are yeah, the 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 the, um, the a woman is like reading these things out to her ghost child in the form of a like a crude special effect. It's uh, it's quite impressive actually. Things out the most, considering the, that this is a film where the most expensive thing is the camcorder itself. Yeah, it's actually reasonably impressive that they managed to do a floating cup and impressions in the in the chair. Where yeah, the visible ghost son is supposed to be sitting. Yeah, I actually quite, I remember really liking that 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 impression thing. Yeah, I don't know actually how you <laughs> how you do that on I mean on that kind of budget really, but yeah, it was quite impressive yeah. actually. Yeah. So the second story is called The Brothers, but it doesn't have Colin Baker in it. It's um it's very hard to tell what's going on for the longest time in this story actually because the the first bit is narrated it's narrated underneath a massive parping Casio tone tune that yes. just drowns everything out. And then the story itself starts off with two minutes of wandering through darkened corridors, breaking off from comprehensible dialogue, then another two minutes of wandering, and then more dialogue, and that Casio is parping on and off at the whole time, so nothing anybody is saying is coming through. Eventually, and mostly after the fact, it becomes clear that these guys are breaking into a funeral home and stealing a corpse, and that turns out to be the rich brother, and it's the poor brother who's stealing it. He's played by... Chester and Turner's brother Keith and uh, Chester gives him a monologue to deliver which is delivered about as well as it's written mm. um, and delivered straight to the corpse and it's, expos- and it's massively expository and it actually feels vaguely Shakespearean if Shakespeare was shit because <laughs> it's the kind of thing he did, it's, it's like a soliloquy to the audience explaining this is what the plot's going to be yeah. Except it's rubbish. Mm. Basically, the, the gist of it is that the rich brother was a bastard and ruined the poor brother's life for laughs and then went and died before Keith, the poor brother, could kill him. So Keith wants revenge on his corpse. 
And that turns out to mean dressing him up as a clown. Because... <laughs> yeah, because... <laughs> and burying yeah. him in the garden. Yes. Quite a famous bit, apparently, is the laughing fit that he has yes. after explaining his plans. Mm-hmm. Which I suppose is supposed to sound like bwah ha 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 laughter, but weirdly seems more authentic as mad laughter the way it is delivered because of because it's so poorly delivered just weirdly mirthless and involuntary sounding and also he won't shut up yes it, there are like um youtube compilations or, or clips of like just him walking down those corridors just doing that laughing it's so badly delivered it feels like it's actually involuntary and coming from some place of madness inside of him he goes out and he digs an hole to put the clown in um, and this is all to even more looping Casio music which at this point I wrote this down sounds increasingly like the soundtrack to a Homestar Runner Halloween cartoon <laughs> it's all but indistinguishable <laughs> yeah meanwhile clown boy comes to life again for no reason at all with a planet of evil red CSO overlay and uh stalks down the stairs with a big close-up of clown shoes and actually quite effective uh, close-up of the clown walking downstairs. Mm. It's it, it's a shame it's not a scarier clown costume. Yes. Because it, it's, it just it just looks like pyjamas. Yeah, and it just looks... It's just so obviously just sort of that guy, just some guy in a as a clown, but it's like not... It's not full-on clown proper. It's just... Just a guy. You'd think it would be the easiest thing in the world to make a scary clown in a horror movie. <laughs> yes. Anyway, then he, he, go, he goes down. Uh, Turner completely blows the scary reveal of the door being opened to reveal the clown. And they have a fight. And it's incredibly annoying to listen to because of all the noise, which turns out to be processing on the clown brother's voice. Yes. It took me a very long time to realise he was supposed to be talking at all because it just sounds like sine waves and bleeps. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, almost nothing he says is comprehensible in the least or even recognisable as speech. Mm. He says, you can't kill me. That's about the only thing you can understand that he says that that can be understood. Yeah. Yeah, it's... um, I wonder how he did it. I mean, I I wonder how Chester Turner did it because... uh, the the same kind of weird vocal effect i think you can hear it at, obviously i said you can hear it at the beginning i think it's slightly more recognizable as a as a vocal effect there maybe i don't know what you think about that well you can tell it's speech in the in the beginning you can yeah, yeah. He must have had a few guitar pedals maybe and just sort yeah of, yeah well he was obviously having a lot of fun with it mm, mm. but the end result is that we can't understand a blind word anyone's saying yeah so they have a fight Clown man impales his brother with a garden fork. His brother oozes tomato puree out of his mouth. Um, the clown has a one-liner in which he says God knows what uh, and then buggers off and that's the end. I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what the clown's going to do now. Maybe go, <laughs> just go change back into his suit and go back to the morgue and be dead again. Yeah, that seems to be the plan, yes. But, um, yeah, so the weird thing about this movie is that... It, those are really the only two stories yeah. in this thing other than the overarching thing and the first one is sort of just sort of it sort of stops dead before it can really properly get going it sort of nullifies it's only about itself. 10 minutes long yes yeah the second one comes to about half an hour yeah yeah most of which is fanning about in the um the funeral home yes but the, the framing story does turn out to be a story in its own right as well. Yeah. It has a good 20 minutes after after the clowns buggered off. And apparently uh, Chester Novell Turner's first film, Devil Doll, Black Devil Doll from Hell, was supposed to be um, the third story in this anthology. His vision obviously grew uh, beyond the confines of an anthology. It had to be told in a film of its own right. That's interesting. For some reason, I, I, I didn't... Maybe I did read that and I forgot it, but, yeah, that does make sense, actually, because um, 
Yeah, the first one, I've never actually bothered watching it because it's... It, 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 people say it's very, 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 very long and grueling and that the same things sort of keep happening, but it's like just shot slightly differently or something. And it's, I mean, I have actually got the <laughs> the DVD set of both films and I really do... I, I, it, it, this is going to sound crazy, but I really do love Tales from the Quad Ed Zone. I, it's just something about it. I just, <laughs> it's just so perfect for me, really. And it's um. I, I don't hate it. I've been very rude about it, but I don't hate it. Okay, that's good. Yes, I just are worried that some people might might sort of miss, you know, construe it. But uh, no. what you're saying, but there's um, yeah, it's it's. I just really, really loved it. It's almost like a kid-like glee in everything with the Casio yeah. keyboard, the um, the the almost special effects, the the fact that it was shot on video as well, and because um, being shot on video was a thing that had been actually legitimized by that point. On um, you had a lot of director video. Uh, features that actually were shot on video. There was there was like a whole bunch of these things. I think the first one was made like in 1983 or 82, and that was filmed on like a reasonably professional uh, beta cam kind of deal, and they had like video effects on that. Uh, mm. it's, it's something about something happening in a sorority house, as you can imagine, and yeah, stuff like that mm. happens. This is obviously... I mean, it's it's the most banal statement in the world to say it's a bad film. Of course it's a bad film. Mm. It's bad on every conceivable level and a few more that Chester Novell Turner has invented mm. for himself. <laughs> Surprisingly, for a film with quite a lot of blood in it, it's, it's strangely good-natured in, it, in its existence, not its stories, just in its existence. It's, it's so clearly the product of a man who just wants to make a film and wants to... And wants to do something, and I've I've read a thing that said it, in 1987, the possibility of someone making a just some random person being able to make and distribute a film it was almost impossible. So the mere, mere fact that this existed and actually came out as a as a video, albeit only printed about 200 of them for friends and family mostly, mm. circulating in in the in the Chicago area. Mm. But the mere fact that he even managed to do that is impressive. Yeah, I be, I think I read that. Um, yeah, the first because Black Devil Doll thing that was came out as uh, under like for a major majorish video label, and they ripped him off somehow, and then he mm. made the second thing as a kind of uh, another attempt. But it kind of he, yeah, he just ended up just making it as a kind of a yeah personal project kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it's it's impossible to it's it's bad, but it's impossible to resent. Mm. Mm. Or it should be impossible to resent if you're not if you know if you're not a bastard. Yeah, yeah. I did see the review the cinema snob did of it, in which he's just rude to it and yelling at Ch Chester Novell Turner, and it's like watching a man kick a puppy for ten minutes. There's a phrase I managed to write down. That I didn't manage to work in, but I'm going to say it anyway. Dark place without the ego. <laughs> That's basically what this is. Yeah. So it's, if Garth Marenghi was A, real, and B, a African-American living in Chicago without any particular inflated opinions of himself, this is, this is how it would have ended up. This is yeah. how a dark place would have ended up. Yeah. So we should probably describe. Uh, do you want to? I don't know. Do you want to like mention any more about the ending, or do you just want to like leave that in sort of spoiler territory? Or oh yeah, yeah. The uh, framing story um, is basically the third story in its own right. Yeah. And uh, um, I don't think it's really possible to spoil this film. I suppose not. No, it's it's. I don't really think it's possible to actually actually genuinely care about what's happening in it. Yeah, it's it's a thing that is, it comes across. Uh, yeah. The effect of it comes across purely from the way it's executed, rather than the plot and story. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, it get it does get kind of, it does get kind of real with the third story because it, the 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 dead ghost son's dad shows up and starts beating the shit out of 
um, out of Shirley mm. for no obvious reason. Uh, so she murders him, as you would. And at this point, there's still 15 minutes to go. I was actually quite surprised. I genuinely didn't know where it was going anymore. Because I knew the first two stories were done. I had no idea what was going on, what, where it was going now. But the, the police show up because they're psychic, presumably. There's nobody around to call them. And it's just literally 30 seconds after he died. But, uh, yeah, these two presumably plainclothes policemen show up to arrest her. Um, she has a sort of skippily eye child star montage of memories to wildly inappropriate circus music using the Wurlitzer setting on the Casio. Um, and then rather graphically uh, slits her own throat with a straight razor. Yes. And then there's a happy ending. Yeah, there is things. actually, isn't there? <laughs> because now they're both Planet of Evil CSO ghosts. <laughs> yes, yes. And she starts reading from the book again, and it turns out to be the framing story that she's reading. Yeah, which is something I think that, uh, weirdly enough, was done a few years later in, um, was it, Freddy's New Nightmare, or Wes Craven's New Nightmare, where there's all this business with Freddy Krueger. Yeah, and then Wes that... Craven's New Nightmare does end like that, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heather Langer Camp starts reading out the script to her, to her son. Yes. I doubt Wes Craven saw this, though. No, no, no. Just, uh... I don't think he was from Chicago. No, no. And it ends with the message, the tales from the Quad Ed Zone will return, which they did not. Yes, I'm actually quite sad that it didn't return. Really, it's uh, I just I just want I just, I just it's one of those things I wanted more of, even through you know it, yeah yeah yeah. He probably busted his nuts to, and to turn around all and Shirley and all their friends probably busted their nuts to get this made. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's um, realistically, I don't think he was able to like really keep on yeah. doing it anymore. It's just sort of no. Yeah. I mean, eventually, eventually, everyone in the world assumed he was dead until he started to show up at conventions. Yeah, yeah, and um, he uh, he's he's done like a, I think he's done a few interview. Yeah, he's done a few interviews. Yeah, done, yeah. done some interviews and documentaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've never explained what quadded means. Maybe it's maybe we don't need it explained. Well, we definitely don't need it explained. No. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I just, uh, I just, one other thing I like about this is um, some of the CSO effects, um, I noticed that they're done in a particular way that um, you were able to do with camcorders of that vintage where they'd have a, there was like a memory thing and you could point like a piece of card, like it had an actual attachment to it, which you would sort of attached to the just over the lens bit and it had like a little bit of a gap so it would fr uh, frame it and also uh, not be like out of focus and it was just like a, a basic sort of tiny little card they were like pre-made and you could obviously make your own and you slot them in and like one was like a keyhole one was like a heart shape and then you could uh, like you would digitize that and then get this crude sort of two color image and um, you'd, uh, you could invert, you could change the colour, and sometimes if the light wasn't properly, you'd get this sort of f kind of furry, fuzzy like, stuff around the border. And I noticed that exact effect uh, yeah. flaw in, the, in this, actually. So, yeah. He definitely got all of the potential special effects use out of that camcorder. Yeah, yeah. It, it it actually weirdly enough it reminds me of my own things I did with my camcorder. With um, there was like an animation feature, which in reality it recorded like two seconds of footage and it rewound the tape automatically. So that was now like half a second, and it was like, a, and I recorded um, stuff like. One thing I did was Snow White to the Revenge, which is just the witch coming back and killing everyone, and it's like <laughs> it's like a cutout thing with that. I did when I was, and I also used the audio dub feature on the same camcorder to dub um, um, "Born to Be Wild" by Steppenwolf, and that was like the a soundtrack to that. So there you go. Yeah, it's just the same kind of impulse, really. Ultimately, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very nice. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I I would definitely recommend this. Um, it, it 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 for some people maybe obviously the pacing is 
crazily yeah. off obviously there's um yeah yeah it uh, goes all over the place with you know the laughing and the and also the first yeah. one is rather cut short but yeah it is definitely something i would recommend i've still I, i've still not, not seen not to normal people yes not to, not to people who actually want to watch a film, but people. Yes. But to exactly. people who want to watch a, a, a bad film. Yeah, a, a good bad film. That's you know that's yeah. uh, even through there are long, uh, long stretches of just odd things. You know, with the Casios blaring over it. Yes. Yeah. Like, it's all part of the experience as well. It, really, it is. It's all part of the. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend this. I've um, I've still not seen Black Devil Doll. Uh, uh, it, it does seem to be the uh, very heavily extended to the point where I think some people who like and appreciate Tales from the Quadded Zone weren't able to really hack that because it's just so yeah. long and repetitive. But um, one of these days, I am going to have to get that disc out and mm. watch. It. Apparently, apparently, the director's cut is one hundred and forty minutes. Oh, which yeah. does seem, which does seem excessive. Yeah, the I think the original cut that was released by whatever that that video label uh, that, uh, that picked it up, it was like some, I think it was only about like eighty minutes or seventy minutes or something. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about mm. that. Yeah, yeah, but yes, that's. Um, oh, now I have to do an outro now. Um, oh. So yeah, that is um, Theory of Obscurity, episode five, the um, director video special. You could view it as in yeah. a way. Yes. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> and um, this will be going out on. You probably are listening to this either on like YouTube or SoundCloud. That's my SoundCloud or Apple Masks YouTube channel. It'll also. I think it'll also be going up on. What, what is it? Podomatic. What is it? Podomatic. What? Yeah. It, well, I do believe send it to iTunes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't use iTunes anymore, so I actually don't have any way of verifying that. Yeah, I don't use iTunes either, so, so I don't know. Either. But um, if you're listening to this on iTunes, hello. <laughs> yes, hello. Yes, but uh, yeah. So there you go. It's um, that's episode five. Of, uh, uh, sorry if I'm I'm sounding kind of out of it. It's uh, not only is it very it's still quite hot, though not as hot as previously. But also, there's just been all sorts of things happening. My mum was, like, on the phone to somebody for ages. And also, just as I was about to log into Skype for the first time, which is how we record these things, uh, some random people came round asking about whether we were paying too much on our gas or electricity, as if there wasn't a pandemic going. And there, it was, like, perfectly normal for them to be doing that again, you know. So, um, yeah. But anyway... <laughs> That is it for uh, episode five, as I've already said. We're both on we're both on pills for our brains as well. <laughs> we, so. we are. <laughs> we are generally on pills. Capable for of brain. anything. Uh, it's a miracle we're able to like switch a computer on sometimes. Yeah. But, um, My mum accidentally took one of mine once, and she was high as balls for the rest of the evening. Really? Yeah. Oh man. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah. Okay. So that is. Um, <laughs> that's the end of the podcast five we'll see you in about two weeks I th- uh, maybe yeah about two weeks t- presumably two weeks with a some other things that uh, we have sent to each other via a youtube link or uh, you know you remember the intro i gave i wrote yeah. that down and you, i didn't you know the premise of this 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 you've listened this this far you know the premise <laughs> I thought I had to write it down because I always make I'm always like wobbling all over the place usually when I'm delivering yeah. these things. Okay, that is it. <laughs> That's yes. it. I am. I, no, hang on. We have to do the two Ronnies thing. He was Apple Mask, and it's good night from him. <laughs> good night. <laughs> <laughs>